It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today is the day the Pacers play a game that counts. Their record will not be 0-0 zero and zero anymore. Their offseason moves will manifest on the court. Rick Carlisle will coach a real game. Pacers Hornets tonight. Some to break down there. And we wanted to do this yesterday, but... Brogdon decided to get a bunch of money and extend with the franchise. So we'll push it to today. Two bold predictions about the Pacers. And joining me to do that, you might know him from Indy Cornrows and the Indy Cornrows podcast, also covering the NBA at Premium Hoops. And fear the sword, Mr. Mark Schindler. Mark, how's it going, man? Tony, I'm good, man. It's been a, it's been a second since we've gotten to pod, so I'm looking forward to this. How, how are things on your end? It is good. It has been a second since you covered every team in the league. <laughs> Over on the Premium trying, NBA man. podcast, he got he got someone to cover all thirty, I believe. So, man, it was a, yeah. it was something. It was a labor of love, let me tell you. But uh, <laughs> we're we're just about done. I think I have like two or three more to do. But no, it's been uh, it's been fun, man. I'm just ready for it to finally be basketball. It is, yeah. God, of course, the rumors are swirling today, but it's day one of the season. The games start in an hour, so we're gonna try to not get through this and and talk Pacers before the games start. Uh, but today what we want to do, because, you know, for previewing the first game, we could talk about the Hornets and we will in their off season. But the way I like to preview games is look at what a team has done and their numbers and stuff like that. And we don't really have any of that information. And the preseason is crap, especially for the Hornets who missed Rozier for a lot of it. No Hayward for a lot of it. So they're a little tougher to pin down. So what we're going to do and what this was the plan for yesterday is two bold predictions about the Pacers, one from each of us. And then we'll talk a little Pacers Hornets at the end. So Mark, as the guest. I will throw the table to you. What is your first bold prediction about the Indiana Pacers this coming season? So I have two ways I could go with this. I have uh, I have two. One is uh one is not really that spicy, but you know me, I am not. I, I think you and I both do not really enjoy doing takes. Uh, I am bad at bold. Lots of stuff. Yeah, I'm very bad at takes. Um, I'll I'll go with the spicy one first. Um, this is something that I've, and again, obviously, is not reported or anything, but my. Just going into the season, I think that it is more likely that somebody who is not Miles Turner or Demonis Bonus gets traded this season uh, before one of them does. And oh, before that, okay, that I was yes. gonna say. I, I don't know if that's spicy. The before one of them does. There you go. That's something. Yeah, uh, I think that's off the bat. Okay, entirely entirely likely this season. And and just to preface too, like I've been thinking about it a lot today. Uh, Zach Lowe talked a little bit about the Pacers on on low post, and it, 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 what he said really resonated with me. Um, you know, I think not every national person has like the greatest uh, idea of where the Pacers are at. And I feel like he's always had a pretty good pulse on it. Um, and, you know, he just talked about like this year really feels like something has to happen with the Pacers one way or another. Like, yes, Rick Carlisle is here. Yes, new shiny rookies. But also this is the same team essentially that has been here in, for, for about three seasons now with obviously some tweaks. But for the most part, the top five, six, seven are, are the same guys and health or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like the, there, there has to be something that breaks some, some way or another this year. Um, do you know who I'm thinking of that that would potentially be traded instead of Miles or Domas? Well, I was gonna say the one guy that kind of breaks this being bold is Jeremy Lamb because yeah. the thought was that he could be traded anyway. So if Duarte is truly this guy that we saw in the preseason and can actually not be like awesome, but like okay, you're in the you're playing every day and it's good, like. This isn't bad for us. Then, yeah, Jeremy Lamb's still superfluous at his salary, even if he is maybe a little better than he was last season. So, if, if it's him, that isn't the boldness that I think you know that would shake this up. But if you're talking a guy that no one sees coming gets traded before yeah. Turner Sabonis, that's, that's I think what I'm are. talking about. I am going to guess yeah. you are talking about Mr. Warren. Yes, I am. Okay, um, I figured. I then I, I would again. I would preface it on saying this because I'm so bad at takes. Like I don't, <laughs> I don't think that they should trade TJ Warren. I don't think that that will happen. But just given KP in this front office's track record, they do whatever they can to find uh, stuff on the margins. Um, TJ is. I mean, his his free agency has just gotten murkier now with 
you know, he was he was never going to accept uh, any kind of extension on on what he could get because the the max extension you could get way undervalues who he is as a player. But now it just gets really murky considering the injuries that have kind of compounded for him and where he's at now. Um, but he's also a six eight wing who can play defense, handle the ball a little bit, and score at a high level. So it's just like you never know what that's going to look like. Um, so that's something that I've just tossed around in my head a little bit. I'm not sure that that's something I actually think will happen, but um, I do think just given how everything's kind of gone surrounding Miles and Delmas and those talks, like, um, it, I don't know. It doesn't seem impossible to me is, is how I would phrase it. I think that this is a very narrow group that I'm going to describe very broadly. I think of the good non-centers on the team, I would say Warren's the most likely player to get traded. That's only like seven players. That's not yeah. like this huge group, but like, Malcolm literally can't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brogdon, uh, or Brogdon, excuse me, Turner and Simonis are centers, so they don't count here. Karras, they just got, right? So I don't think they're going to be moving on from him this year. McConnell, they just resigned, so he can't for a while. And again, same reason. I don't think they would move on from him. And the only other guy who's probably looking like he's going to be in the rotation every day is Torrey Craig. I don't know if he's good enough to even be in this group where it's like groundbreaking if he's traded. But again, they just got him. Probably won't trade the rookies. So that leaves that leaves Warren. And He's expiring. If he like, if he like buys a souvenir on the road, and the and the, and he's like, oh, I like this city. You know, any indication that maybe he's not like fully committed. You know, I can see the office front office sniffing out trade possibilities just because he's an expiring. So that makes sense to me. I wouldn't do it, but I'm yeah. not in charge, and I don't know what TJ Warren is thinking. So I get where that comes from. Yeah. No. Exactly. I'm in the same boat with you. Like, I just don't think. I mean, the the. The Pacers were lacking that kind of player since Paul George got traded. So it's like, I don't think that you should go out of your way to trade TJ Warren, but you never know what happens, man. Um, so, all right, I'm, I'm excited. Where's your take? Or, or Here's you a, you went with a, a pretty grandiose big one. So I'll I go did. with a little smaller one that is a bold prediction that will kind of make two bold predictions in one. Mm-hmm. I think Isaiah Jackson is going to play twice as many minutes as Goga Batadze this season. As a rookie, yeah. and Goga's entering his third year. I think Goga might be better right now. That's close. You know, people going on preseason loving Isaiah. I get it. He was awesome on defense. Goga was also awesome on defense. He also has two years of NBA experience under his belt. I think Goga's better, but I think Carlisle likes Isaiah more. I think that they believe that he can play the four a little more than, a lot more than Goga can. And I think it's going to lead to him playing a lot more than Goga. And in turn, the front office and coaching staff find Goga to be superfluous and you know, he's got his rookie option coming up at the end of this month. There's no reason for them to turn it down cap wise, but his future with the team could be tweaked a little bit because of that. But my bold prediction, both because I think Isaiah can be pretty good. His defense is is ridiculous for someone of his age already. Like I thought all these people at Media Day were just being ridiculous when they're like, Oh, I think he can guard one through five. Like he's been crazy in these scrimmages. I'm like, okay, this dude's never played in the NBA. What are we doing? But he's pretty dang good at, at defending guys with the ball. So I think Isaiah plays at least twice as many minutes as Goga. Uh, I don't know how effective he'll be in those minutes, but I think he'll play kind of a lot. Yeah, I think I would agree as much as it hurts me to say, because I think you and I are both in in the same spot with Goga. Like he just needs playing time and it it feels like it's just not going to happen on this roster, unfortunately. Um, But I I think that's such a good point too, about Goga being better right now. Cause I think a lot of people look at it and be like, Oh, well, Isaiah is clearly better. And I think, He's more versatile, like he can be played in in more different ways and employed in different ways. But I don't necessarily think it means he's better. Like, um, you know, it, it, you're kind of pulling hairs with it in some ways. But yeah, like you talked about defensively uh, for a team that's trying to be better defensively. Like I know they finished 13th last year and that felt like a mirage given how the the last three months of the season went. 14th. Oh, it was 14th. My the bad. level uh, YouTube watchers can see me marking the number. You know, how I have it memorized. I looked it up one day. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming you mean like defensive rating, like per 100. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was talking to Lloyd Pierce after a practice and I, and I said, Lloyd, Rick has you in charge of defense. And this team fell from sixth in defense last year to, and I was going to say 14th last, or excuse me, six, two years ago to 14th last year, before I even said 14th, Lloyd Pierce goes, yeah, 14th. I was like, oh, he's got the numbers down. This guy's ready to fix the defense. So now I will never forget that they were 14th last year because that's hilarious, man. (laughs) Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I see Isaiah helping and fixing that, or they they at least view him as somebody who has the versatility to do that. Um, 
yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm right on there with you. I, I don't think it's bold to be completely honest. Not the, not the, not the really? crap on your take, but I do. My think next one is definitely a, more bold, bold, but yours was way bolder at the start. So I feel like I have to like, you know, yin and yang balance things. Exactly. Out. I think Isaiah can be good. Don't get oh, me wrong. Oh yeah, he's gonna be good. Like I'm confident that you can play Duarte every game, and he'll put up some stinkers because he's a rookie. But like most of the time, you'll be fine with that. Whereas Isaiah, I'm not as confident that if he's an everyday player, he'll be a plus all the time. You know, there'll be some rockiness there. So that's why I'll be. I'm, I. That's why you would say maybe don't do that. But I think just given what we've seen in preseason and the amount of just gas that Isaiah Jackson has gotten from Pacers brass coaches and players makes mm-hmm. me think that he will be playing more than Goga. Which poor Goga. That's not really why I wanted to talk about this, but it it just is what it is. And I think that that's that is one of my bold predictions. Can I ask you a question off that? Actually, not the high sure. podcast. Do you think he plays more minutes than O'Shea Brissett this year? Ah. Uh, don't do this to my poor heart, man. This is like the biggest question I have coming out of preseason. I did a whole pod on I think O'Shea should play more. It could be a big question because I think O'Shea's good. And he's only 23. Yeah. There, we have a YouTube commenter because I did a podcast on O'Shea and I said his age like 100 times. Who always comments, how old is O'Shea Brissett? So I just <laughs> said it. That person is now satisfied. Um, but yeah, I think O'Shea's good enough to deserve minutes. But they they had Isaiah above him in preseason. Yeah. But they really were wild with the bench in the preseason. So I have no idea how real that is to any extent so maybe i'm maybe i'm even wrong about the isaiah goga ranking too but i i think they might have isaiah over o'shea which would be surprising i am not rick carlisle but if i was rick carlisle i would have o'shea over tory craig even because i am yes. that bold but i don't think they're going to do that either given what they've done in preseason so we'll see o'shea might end up in a really awkward spot which was, is surprising to me no, yeah, I'm right there with you. I uh, I've thought the same. Like I thought O'Shea should be like the seventh man coming in this year, like first forward off the bench. Um, and it's not like he had a bad preseason. Like he had limited run for the most part, but I thought he looked good. Uh, he beat his handles clearly tighter. The shot didn't really fall for him, but it's such a small sample size. Like you don't really know what to take from that. Um, I'm just interested to see how that plays out throughout the year because that's one of the more uh, interesting storylines for how they view things. And I wonder if part of it's like uh, not to like it you know, two tinfoil hat, but I mean, he spent time with, with Nate Bjorken in, in Toronto. That was a big part of why he signed with the Mad Ants. And then he comes up and, and performs well under Nate Bjorken in his system. Uh, so I wonder how, how that factors in and, and, you know, what the, how the coaching staff views him in, in the new system. But regardless, I think he's shown enough to be playing more, but we'll see how it plays out on court. Well, he's one of the, I, he's the only player. He's the only player in this situation on the team. Most of them, have either come from a different team two years ago or or have been with the Pacers for the last two years to where this is their third system in three years. O'Shea is mm-hmm. the only guy who was with the Raptors two years ago and the Pacers last year. So his system was the same. So this change is a little bigger for him too. And so I wonder if maybe he just doesn't fit with Carlisle's stuff as much in camp. I don't. I haven't asked him about that as much. You know, he likes O'Shea. He said he likes O'Shea. And by the way that injuries have gone, and the way that the rotation has shaken out every preseason game, O'Shea ended up in the rotation, but it wasn't like it didn't look like it was the choice of the team. Yeah. It just like happened. You know what I mean? So we'll see. How, I think that's something to watch in the first game. All right, I want to do my bigger bold prediction. All now. right, I'm ready for it. But first, I gotta talk about the great people over at Sweat Block because if you're like me, you excessively sweat sometimes. And it's a huge pain. And for weeks we've been talking about sweat block, the wipes that stop sweat. For seven days, and people have been listening. We uh, we have friends of Lockdown who've tried Sweat Block and love it. Uh, some teachers, they no longer sweat in front of their class. A Hollywood producer tried it on recommendation of Lockdown. Uh, working on the set of a Marvel movie, no more sweat there. Soccer players, too. Uh, true believers have come from everywhere. Lockdown listeners loving Sweat Block. And next one could be you. Stop excessive sweat for up to seven days per use. It's a doctor-created and doctor-recommended way to perspire less, and they have a dry shirt guarantee. If sweat blocks, wipes, don't keep you dry, you'll get your money back, not just for armpits, chest, back, feet, hands. Use it anywhere, and I mean anywhere that sweats. If someone you care about is dealing with excessive sweat, then you have to check out Sweat Block. Get it today. They have the wipes and deodorant. You can get it for 20% off at sweatblock.com with the promo code Locked On. You can also get it at Amazon and CVS, but no discount there. Go to sweatblock.com. Use that promo code locked on today. This week's Find Your Frontier NBA highlight is brought to you by the all new 2022 Nissan Frontier. 
The adventure begins where the road ends. So get out there and find your frontier. With little intel and hardly any scouting opportunities, the Milwaukee Bucks took a swing in the 2013 NBA draft, selecting an anonymous immigrant teenager living in Greece named Giannis Antetokounmpo with the 15th overall pick. Despite lacking high-level professional experience and any familiarity with the United States, Antetokounmpo came to Milwaukee with a dogged determination to be great and made it happen. The Greek freak, as he came to be known, rewarded the Bucks with tireless work and steadfast loyalty, becoming a two-time MVP in the face of the franchise. After signing an extension to stay in the Midwest, Giannis in 2021 finally won a championship, the second in Bucks franchise history. Giannis Antetokounmpo and the Bucks forged a new frontier for the global game of basketball. How will you? Find your frontier today in the all-new 2022 Nissan Frontier. Shop NissanUSA.com. Thank you for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today. Let's do more bold predictions. I made Mark go first last time, so it's my turn to go first as he just sat there and listened to me talk about sweat products. Mark, my second bold prediction falls on the shoulders of none other than Mr. Karis LeVert. Ooh. There's 13 All-Stars in the East, and I believe Karis's name is going to be one of them this season. I don't oh, really. Okay. Is that too bold for you? No, I don't think it's too bold. <laughs> um, I think, okay, this is interesting because I, I know a lot of people, at least you and I are both pretty analytic, a- a- analytical in how we look at things. I am. Um, and I think you know most people who come from our background or at least the, that look at the game that way are a little bit, uh, quite a bit lower on Karis than that. Um, and I think I'm kind of there with you. Uh, I feel like, you know, this might be the year where he has some things really click for him. Uh, and A, he's just going to have stable talent around him. Um, you know, he, he the roster was really in flux for him uh, towards the back end of his time in Brooklyn. And obviously last year was a, was a year. Um, I could see it. Yeah. Man. Like the scoring numbers are, are ridiculous for him. I think a lot of it's just... Um, getting to the rim more and cutting out some of the chaff in his game, which I th- he's one of the guys who I think is possible for because his handle is good enough. Like he has the burst. Um, it's just making some more reads and decisions to get there. So I guess I, I don't want to say it's crazy, crazy spicy, but like it's still spicy, but it's, I could see it, man. I think I've, I've cursed with this because last year I said TJ Warren would be the all-star after his bubble uh, run. And then he played. Dude, it would have happened, so, honestly, as far as I'm concerned. It, yeah. If Karras only plays like 10 games this year, he's already hurt right now. Then, I will know never to predict anyone to be an all-star again. But just going through quotes I had from last season, I just wrote a piece about Karis and Doma, so it's fresh on the mind when I when I do this. But going through quotes from last season, Karis's teammates really were impressed with one how he fit with Domas, which is why I wrote that piece. But also the, his his playmaking for others got a lot better from day one against the Suns to end of season. His last game, I, he didn't play in the playing tournament. I forget who his last opponent was. The Raptors, whatever. You know, he got a lot better at playing with his teammates and learning the system. And it's a different system this year. But the reason that was impressive to me is they were playing like Keelan Martin 25 minutes a game back then. And Justin Holiday's playing big minutes and McConnell's playing big minutes. And like these guys are, are NBA players. They're good, but they're not the level of guys that they're going to be playing this year. And Brogdon's going to be playing more. And he'll, I think Karras and Turner played like nine games together or something. That's an estimate. I don't know the exact number. Like, just putting him with better teammates, and I think Carlisle is going to really trust him with the ball. He averaged 21 points per game with this team last year. I think he can carry that momentum with a similar roster very easily. I think him and Sabonis fit really well together, and Karras has talked about how Domas is the best big he's ever played with, and Karras, his best offensive skill to me is his pick-and-roll ball handling ability. He makes mm-hmm. pretty good decisions outside of some junk floaters that you were talking about. Uh, just you know, Between the three-point line and like 10 feet from the basket, he could do with a few less shots there, but... Cleaning up that decision-making, I think his fit with this team is really good. I think his scoring ability is very good. And I think he's got a chance, a chance to be the Pacers' best offensive player. And do I think he'll be the best Pacer? No. But that's not what gets voted for for All-Stars. So I think Lavert's got a shot to make the team. If he yeah, plays. and I think a good way of putting it, too, is considering – I mean, I guess part of this would hinge on how long TJ is out. Um, because um, as much as I hate that that's a thing, like – Somebody has to score. And I think in terms of people that you, you look at who are scoring with the ball in their hands this year, like I actually would bet that Domas' scoring numbers go down a little bit. Um, given We like, said that last year, I believe, in a podcast together. Well, we, we, we did say we're that both wrong. Year, but, <laughs> but also, like, it just feels like this uh, – if, if preseason is any indicator, it feels like it for sure, given his, how he was utilized a little bit. Um, 
But like just looking at last year, once things really clicked, obviously part of it is you have to account for pace. But, you know, in the last 14 games of the year, he was averaging 25 points per game. I think it was like just under 20 shots. But um, like you were talking about, he really hit his stride. Him and Domas both just like absolute terror to close the year. Um, and I don't think that that's entirely sustainable, but I think scoring over 20 points per game uh, for this season on like above league average true shooting, like I, I see that for sure. If, if he's healthy and things really click with the team. There are certainly factors that would make it hard, but yeah, especially if Warren's out for a while, right? Like mm. to call on, I think Marcus Gasol's navicular kept him out for like 80 something games, which is a year of actual NBA calendar time. I know that having a full season in six months really broke everybody's timing brain, but it's not crazy that Warren misses a lot of time before the break. So we'll see how that affects Levert. I think he's got a shot at it, though. And I wanted that to be a bold prediction. I don't know if it'll happen, but I think it is within the realm of possibility. And I want to do it. Mark Schindler, your second bold prediction for the Indiana Pacers. this season. Oh, man. Um, trying to think of a second one is very difficult. I have one. I don't know how much I, I, I believe in it. Um, the team does not finish top 10 in offense or defense. Wow. Wow. I do think that that – I the part of it is just I'm lower on the team headed into the year uh, as things have gone on. And, again, I would say, like, I 50% believe that. Like, I don't really necessarily believe that. I think they'll be top 10 in at least one, but that's that's my take. Like, it's entirely possible that they're top 10 in neither. Still, like, a good team, like, it, right around average. But um, the East is just so much better, man. And looking at this, I was talking to Tom Lewis, who's my, my co-host and editor over in the Cornrows, um, like this team, I think they'll be below 500 by around New Year's. But how I much agree. they're below 500 is where it gets murky. Um, like I think if you count out, if you just discount Charlotte and the Raptors, because I don't know what to make of them as um, as as playoff or play in teams. Like I think they both have shots being the play in. I'm not really sure where I'm at with the Raptors, but if you take them out, 27 of the 36 games that they play before New Year's are against teams that are all projected to be playoff teams this year. Like that is a crazy, crazy schedule. Obviously, so Carlisle talked about it at media day, but given where they're at with injuries and how that starts, like the beginning of the year could be so rough for them. And even just like even if they have a tear on the back back end of the schedule, like it's as we saw last year, what you do in the first two or three months really sets where you end up rating wise. Um, so I don't think it's entirely crazy to see them being uh, top ten in either, honestly. They were not last year top 10 in either. They were exactly, for, for NBA.com's estimated numbers, admittedly not my favorite thing, but the quickest mm -hmm. one I can look up while I'm talking to your face. They are 14th in both. Perfectly average team finishes 9th in the East. That makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, the schedule certainly could have a, a bearing on this, right? Like it, The thing about the schedule that's weird is twofold here. One is that look, every coach and GM like for all of time has just – never had a thought about the schedule. They're like, we play every team at home and away. Like, that's it. It's so rare that your schedule is so hard that everyone is talking about it. And like at media day, players, coaches, execs are like, oh my God, our schedule is insane at the beginning of the season. Like that is is noteworthy to me that yeah. the Pacers are saying that, which, which is fascinating to me, right? So they recognize the schedule is hard. That will have a bearing on their season. Two, the other interesting factor about their schedule is Carlisle had this last year with the Mavs, right? Not only did COVID hit them, but their schedule was insane to start the season. So their record was not indicative of how good they were early on, and they bounced back from that. So he has the experience to get through a situation like that, but that team had Luka Doncic. This team does, Pacers team does not. So how, if, if they can't rebound or they make moves based on their record, and we talked about moves in the first segment, it's certainly possible they don't get top 10 in either. I think, the, I think it's possible that they get top 10 in defense. They were there two mm -hmm. years ago with a largely similar team. They have Torrey Craig. They're not going to do so much gimmicky stuff on that end. Duarte, in theory, an upgrade over Lamb's minutes on that end of the floor. Right? They, they have ways to be better on defense, for sure, just from the roster. Isaiah Jackson we just talked about. Offense, I don't think they can do it. I think it would take a lot to go right for them to be top 10 in offense. So if the defense doesn't click or maybe they do trade Turner or, or, or Ed Lott, could, they're already hurt a little bit. Right, a lot could go wrong on that end. It's very possible that they end top ten and neither. And if that happens, no chance they're not a play-in team. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I think defense is definitely possible, but um, you know, as they hit on so much in the offseason, like missing TJ really hurt the defense. Yep. Um, so I'm interested to see how that plays out because I still like as much as late, like you mentioned with the offense. Uh, I think 
I mean, if you're playing Tory Craig 20 minutes a game, I the, the offense is going to be a little bit rough. Like he does some stuff that's good, like crashing the glass, and um, he'll hit some some spot ups every once in a while. But if he's going to be asked to dribble the way that he has been in preseason, yeah. I think well, we DM'd about RIP this. to the offensive rating. Yeah. yeah, we DM'd about that. I was like, yeah. did, did we just watch Tory Craig run pick and roll? We did. It happened a lot. Um, I'm interested to see if that carries on. But yeah, I. It's possible. I'm just uh, I'm not as bullish on it. And again, this is me being terrible at takes and having right. everything that well, I say. So, <laughs> well, I'm like we're not even talking about what you your take was. Now we're talking about Tory Craig. Like generally, I'm okay with him playing like 15 to 20 minutes. Like I I'm yeah. I would prefer O'Shea myself. Like I get other rotational decisions that would have him out, but I, I it's fine. Like his defense, the Suns played him almost 20 minutes last year, and he shot 50, 37, 80 from the field and scored seven points a game. Like if he's that guy. Great, you could play him 15 minutes every game, no problem. But his offense in the preseason, half the time he shot the ball, YouTube watchers again have an advantage here. I was like, why are you doing that? You know, you should yeah. not be dribbling. You should be all catch and shoot all the time. So I have no idea what to make of his offensive game or what's going to happen with him. But if he doesn't really click defensively too, he might not play as much and they can't get top 10 in defense. They can't get top 10 in offense if he's one for seven every game. So maybe he is a linchpin to both sides of the ball of, of your uh, bold prediction. Yeah, who knows? I hope, man, I hope not. I hope all my predictions are wrong, but we'll see on that end. <laughs> I am not good at bold predictions. Adam is way better than I am. Oh, the, Adam's so good at bold predictions. Adam's favorite predictions. show of the year is is the one we're doing tomorrow where we overreact to their first game because he's way better at like taking one game and being like, oh, these things are happening. I'm like, oh, it's just one game. Like, I, I don't have that many thoughts about one game. But speaking of that one game, we got to talk about Pacers Hornets. Again, very tough to nail down. Who the Hornets are right now, a little bit of a different team. We'll talk about how or the Pacers can get an advantage, the normal game preview stuff. But first, I got to talk to you guys about two great groups of people. The first one being the folks over at Built Bar who are making the best tasting protein bars out there. I think I talk about them every day on the show, and for good reason. They are 100% covered in chocolate, soft and easy to chew protein bars that come in a variety of delicious flavors. I love the peanut butter brownie, the new blueberry muffin ones I just got. Very delicious. Uh, double chocolate's very good. There's so many. You can get a mixed box where you get two of each of nine of their more popular flavors. They're all delicious. You got to try them out. Not only are they delicious, they're healthy too. 17 to 18 grams of protein, 130 to 180 calories, but only four to five grams of sugar, only four to five grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy, and the official protein bar of the U.S. track and field team. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15. You'll get 15% off your order. That promo code is LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. And we got to talk about the awesome folks over at Bet Online who are back and better than ever. They've got a new website interface, and the start of basketball season means they have more props, odds, and lines than ever before. They are your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head over to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to receive that bonus. Basketball, football, baseball in the postseason. NHL is getting started. Already is started, I believe. Boxing, UFC, your favorite Vegas casino games. They've got it all there at Bet Online. Fast and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Sign up with that promo code Locked On. Bet Online, where the game starts. Actual basketball, not bold predictions. Mark and I are much better. Much better at this. A lot. And better. I know yeah. Mark has been <laughs> following every team in the NBA. So perfect guest to talk about Pacers Hornets. I am thrilled that my first basketball viewing experience at the Pacers this year, I get to watch LaMelo Ball play basketball. That is awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank, thank you, NBA gods. So I'll have Mark help me a little bit here, but the Hornets roster tweaks this offseason. They drafted JT Thor, they drafted um, your guy, James Booknight. They signed Kelly Oubre. They drafted Kai Jones. Uh, I, that was all their big changes, correct? Am I, oh, and they traded Ish for Mason Smith, Plumley. Traded, yeah, traded for Mason Plumley. Signed traded Ish for Smith. Mason Plumley, and Ish Smith is another backup point guard. That is not a move that I feel bad about forgetting. But still, yeah, so they worry. have like a different team. I don't know how much better they are, but it, it might be awesome if LaMelo Ball can just make all this stuff click and Hayward plays more games and stuff like that. So what do you think of the Hornets and what they did this summer? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, I liked the trade for Mason Plumley personally. Me too. Uh, I think Cody Zeller is a little bit of a better basketball player, but he's been. I think he played less than two thirds of his games over the last five seasons with the, the Hornets. Like, that's been the issue for him his whole career. Um, Mason Plumley 
last year was the first year where he missed more than like five games, I think, in the last five years. So wow. just based on health, that helps them. And they're not playing Bismack Biombo anymore, who was like just about the worst rotation big in the NBA last year. I think they were minus 13 points per 100 with him on court last year. It's really rough. Um so I like Plumley just adding more of a dynamic pick and roll threat screener that can get that can work on getting Lamelo Ball downhill more, working on some of his craft and pick and roll because that wasn't quite as much last year. It felt like a lot more transition, which will still be a thing. But um, I mean, mostly this team to me is just banking on their young guys growing up and getting yep. even better, which I think makes sense. But also, like they were already the most chaotic team in the NBA last year uh, <laughs> with how they played the game. And I think that's just going to continue this year. Um, but they're good, man. And this team, honestly, like the one of the games against the Hornets was a blowout uh, last year, but the Pacers have had trouble with their athleticism and what they can do in transition. So I think it's a good first test uh, coming into the year, especially playing against a team that has some solid continuity and consistency coming off of last year. Yeah, they are fascinating, right? Like, they lost Devontae Graham. I think that's a big deal. Malik Monk mm-hmm. was actually finally good for them last year. Cody Zeller, when he was with their second unit, was good. Right? So here's what I, I – I'm being too general. But here's what I think about the Hornets. Lamelo's awesome. Hayward's awesome. Plumlee's an upgrade at center. I agree with you there. They'll get – their young guys will get better. I think their starting five will be better than last year. Rozier, mm-hmm. his role in that, obviously. Great shooter. I think their bench – will be a lot worse, like a lot worse, because their bench is going to be a lot of young guys mixing and matching. They're going to try to probably try to get Kai Jones minutes, book nights in there, although he had a nice preseason. You never know what you're going to get from rookies, right? So I think that in general, their balance is a little worse, but they're definitely set up well to have a strong future once those guys get better. And Ubre could be a, a big piece for them, because if he can be the adult with the second unit and he can be a little more of Suns Kelly Ubre, all of a sudden their second unit looks pretty good. So from a matchup perspective, for the Pacers, that's tough because that starting lineup being good is tough for them, especially with the way they play. You mentioned that speed, their transition game. The Pacers kind of want to play up and down like that too, but they don't have the foot speed to, to really keep up. So that that's a fun yin and yang matchup I'll be interested in. But uh, yeah, keep, keeping up with that lamelo Rozier backcourt is going to be tough for the Pacers, I think, and, and how the Hornets really slice up the minutes of their team. And James Brego's got a tough task with how much that – they don't have like a lot of in-between guys. They have a lot of yeah. like – Upper you're either old like or you're, super you're in like third grade. Yeah, it's uh, it's very different. Like, um, <laughs> I think uh, what's what's so tough about this team too is, I mean, the 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 forward and wing depth is a lot better on the team this year. But also, like, how are they guarding Miles Bridges? Because Miles Bridges is a, if I remember correctly, Miles Bridges is starting at the four now, um, and PJ Washington is going to be coming off the bench. So, like, even like let's let's talk about all right if they're coming. Uh, you know, if, if they have PG at the five and Miles at the four and they're playing like that with the bench unit, um, like I, I guess part of the, the defense that you're playing against that is by just being beating the crap out of them on the offensive end, which I think is, is very possible. But also like that is going to be a really great test for the defense right away, seeing, OK, yep. how are you handling LaMelo Ball and, and Miles Bridges running pick and roll together? Because that was devastating last year because they can do all right. Miles Bridges is good enough. He can pop and shoot. If 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 somebody closes out hard to him, he's driving and going. Um, and then he's he's only six six, but he's incredibly dynamic as a roller. He can he can make the short roll pass, uh, and he's an insanely good leaper. So uh, I'm, I mean, it feels like they're going to definitely try and uh, try and find some ways to target uh, some weaker defenders on the Pacers like that. But um, yeah, it'll be. I mean, where are you at with that uh, and how that'll look? First of all, I just sorted their roster by age to confirm what I was saying. They have two guys between ages 23 and 27. Everyone else is either 23 or younger or in their 30s. They just they are all in on a diverse group, which is age diverse age group, which is very interesting. I agree with you. The Pacers struggled with this team last year a little bit too when they went to those PJ at the 5 lineups because mm-hmm. they could really mix up their their screen and whatever's, right? That that's an oversimplistic way of looking at it, but you know, they could have Bridges rolling and his athleticism with Sabonis chasing couldn't really work or whoever they put on him didn't make sense. And then PJ Washington would be the screener and he'd pop and they were lost or they were confused. And then Zeller was just a beast tumbling down the lane, doing whatever the hell he was doing that somehow works all the time. Right. So that they had a nice variety that, that was tough for the Pacers uh, and and those guys are still good and on the team. Right. So that will be, I agree. That will be a, a nice test for the Pacers defense. A lot of screens from the Charlotte team in general, their off ball movement is good and they're really good in transition. But when you have guys like LaMelo, 
who are good advantage creators, you want to give them those screens so they can analyze where the defense might be breaking down or shifting. So the Hornets like to do that kind of stuff. And we haven't even mentioned Gordon Hayward's name a single time hardly yet, but he's like a fringe all-star when healthy. He was great last year before he, he I forget what made him miss so much time. Uh, what this specific Ooh, injury was. Question. But, was it, but he was playing very well before yeah. said injury occurred and he hasn't practiced much. Uh, he was in COVID protocols. I don't know if he had COVID because he said he was vaccinated after he returned from protocols, but he missed a bunch of time in camp and preseason. So no idea exactly what his conditioning level and fit in with the team is right now, but he's also awesome. And he killed the Pacers twice last year when he was healthy and playing and Torrey Craig can kind of be a, an answer to that, but you know, Justin Holiday's health is still in question. One of Sabonis or Turner will presumably have to guard him, which is not a good matchup for the Pacers, um, unless he's a step slower. So, I mean, even if even if they can play good enough pick and roll defense to slow down the way the Hornets really like to play, they still have to deal with like, oh yeah, they have one of the fifty best players in the NBA on their team playing playing power forward. So, uh, it, it's a tough matchup for the Pacers, I think, in the mano a mano starter situations. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, man. I. Uh, yeah, like you mentioned, Gordon Hayward was fantastic against this team last year. Um, they just have so much ability to kind of do the same stuff with all of their guys. Uh, like they they can run, you know, you, you can ask almost anybody in their starting lineup to to run screen and roll and see how it goes. Um, and yeah, it's just going to make it it's going to make it interesting. Like I, I think that what I'm most excited about, though, for, for tomorrow is we'll just get to see, hey, this is competent defense again. Like it, the second that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, crap kind of hits the fan. You're like, okay, well, they're going to resort to something. It's not just going to be like, all right, we'll run out of a matchup zone and see what happens. And like, I don't know. I'm, I'm, so I'm interested to see how that goes. But ultimately, I mean, looking at the other side, um, I, I mean, this is a great matchup for Domas. Like, Domas right. is going to either get get fouled or get re, get rebounds and put it back in. Like, and it's obviously not that simple. But he has a huge size advantage. Um, PJ Washington is not really a great post up defender, even though he's capable as a backline guy. Um, Mason Plumley still gets into foul trouble; like he's not awesome as a defender either. He's solid, but like you know, asking him to defend Domas for an entire night's a lot. So, um, I do think the team has a lot to go on off of there that will be uh, beneficial to them. I agree. The Hornets have done well against the Pacers in the past. I also, though, the Pacers kicked kicked their ass in the playing game because. Yep. One, Domas, they have little answer for. And maybe PJ takes a step forward in the post-defending. Maybe Plumlee is like 10 minutes of a good enough answer to kind of slow that down. But the, the big trouble for Charlotte, and what kind of made that game a blowout, is they also don't have a good answer for Brogdon. LaMelo, we love him. My God, is he fun to watch. He sucks at defense, <laughs> okay? He sucks at defense. He knows where he's supposed to stand, and then he just stands. He doesn't, he doesn't bend his knees. or He's not that good of a defender yet. I think he will be, but he's not. And Ter- Terry Rozier, not that great of a defender either. And they're going to be playing James Booknight, who's a rookie guard. I don't think – are any rookie guards ever really solid positives on defense? You know, I don't even think Duarte is going to be that much of a big plus on defense in this game or this year. Ish Smith's not that good of a defender. They don't have answers for Brogdon too, so that two-man game with him and Sabonis becomes really deadly. And all of a sudden things snowball from there. And we've seen Carlisle tie those two's minutes together in preseason action already. So that could be a thing that gives the Pacers an advantage in this game. And – I think any mix and matching where it's Brogdon, Sabonis, and three bench players against any Hornets non-starting unit will be big moments for the Pacers. And I am really looking forward to finally not watching Bjorkren ball where there's just some random 11-0 run from the other team that's spearheaded by, I don't know, Ish Smith hitting two threes against, yeah, like you said, like a junk matchup zone or something. So having two guys who have clear advantages makes me think the Pacers have a shot in this game. But we haven't seen either of these teams play. I'm not going to ask you to predict a winner like I usually do with guests because – I don't really know how to feel out either of these teams right now. Yeah, no, I feel the same. And I honestly, what I hope to see the most is I just want to see a crazy Hornets lineup, like because they have the ability to do it so much. Just play, play they five, do. six, six to six, seven guys because I want to see it. Like play Kelly Oubre with Lamelo Ball and Miles Bridges and PJ Washington and uh, uh, and like James Booknight. I want to see it. It would be crazy. I don't know how good it would be. The, the passing outside of Lamelo is probably trash, but I want to see it anyways. For the diehard Locked On Pacers or any Cornrows Pod crossover people who have made it 38 and a half minutes in this podcast, or a little shorter if you're in audio form, I have to do some notes really quick. Jeremy Lamb, Justin Holiday, questionable to play. I've seen Justin Holiday do dead sprints at practice uh, recently. I think he'll play. Lamb, I'm a little less sure on, but I still would lean probably 51% he plays. So we could see 
the Pacers minus just Keelan Martin, TJ Warren, and Karis LeVert. Keelan probably wouldn't have played anyway. So decently good health, but not great. Still missing two starters. Pretty gross. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on injuries. We've kind of been talking in, about injuries for like two years with this team, but it is what it is. Uh, I just hope nobody gets injured in this game. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Like, God. Please, dear God, no. Uh, that This team's already had such a rough start with injuries for this year. Um, they cannot afford anymore. No, they cannot. Uh, on the Hornets side, it looks like everybody's good to go. Uh, Terry Rozier and Miles Bridges are both probable. Those are the only two guys they have listed. And then the other Pacers news, Keelan Martin, we were talking about his contract guarantee being something to watch this week after they made their cuts this weekend. He said at practice today that he signed uh, a contract for the season. He ha- was under contract, but he actually signed as, uh, an amendment to his contract that that changes his guarantee amount and date. So he has some guaranteed money, but not fully guaranteed until the league wide cut down date. So Keelan Martin will be on the Pacers for some amount of time this season. Who knows how much time that depends on a lot of other factors. The stuff keeps going his way, and he, and he made the team good for him. He earned it in the preseason, so... Uh, Keelan Martin on the team opening night, and we have some Pacers. Cav, Clarity, do you have any thoughts on that, Mark? Uh, the answer can I, be no. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, no, I don't. I, I just don't really expect Keelan to play that much. Um, I'm happy for him, though. Uh, I'm glad that he got the bag and is going to be around. has a has a stable place to be this year. Yeah. So I'll, of course, be covering all the action here on Locked On Pacers. Mark will be covering Cavs Pacers full NBA action on his litany of things on his plate i i don't even know how many outlets you have now five six uh several so <laughs> yeah well, uh, mark <laughs> speaking of people on youtube can see it right oh wrong 